My name is Bill Thomas. I'm a writer, consulting producer, and now podcaster. I am now trying to use my experience as the brother of a murder victim to help other victims of violent crime. I'm working on a book on the unsolved Colonial Parkway murders, and I'm the co-administrator of the Colonial Parkway murders Facebook group together with Kristen Dilley. My name is Kristen Dilley. I'm a writer, a researcher, a teacher, and a victim's advocate, as well as the social media manager and co-administrator for the Colonial Parkway Murders Facebook page with my partner in crime, Bill Thomas. Welcome to Mind Over Murder. I'm Kristen Dilley. And I'm Bill Thomas. And we're at episode number 80. How did that happen? It's crazy. It feels like we just started this podcast like yesterday. That means that we've been at this for about a year and a half, I think. Year and a half. Mm -hmm. About right. We've got some bonus episodes mixed in there and some more coming up. Yes, uh, we have actually some great bonus episodes coming up for sure. Because I'm on summer vacation, I can do a lot of reading and a lot of listening to podcasts. And I have a lot to share with you guys. And Bill does too. So... Look forward to some upcoming bonus episodes of True Crime Bookshelf and True Crime Media and all sorts of great stuff. And the most important thing when we're talking about something like, while well, we're 80 podcasts into it, is to thank all of you for your support, for listening, yes. telling your friends yes. about Mind Over Murder, writing reviews on every podcast platform you can come up with. <laughs> Remember, you can take that same review and put it in two or three different places, and that's kosher. It's been a pleasure and a privilege working on this podcast. And uh, the response that we've had from so many of you has been so gratifying and so wonderful. So thank you very much for everybody out there who has listened and interacted with us on social media and said kind things. We really, really appreciate it. There's all sorts of stuff going on in the world before we get into our topic for today, which is actually a return to the Colonial Parkway murders. We're sort of getting into the other two double homicides in the Colonial Parkway murders. But before we get there, we wanted to talk about a few things that are going on in the world. I was particularly interested in the Washington Post op-ed that you sent me yesterday and posted on all of our social media pages from Deirdre Enright of the Innocence Project. Deirdre had put out on this past Friday an opinion piece on the Washington Post op-ed page, which leads with the headline, the FBI should use DNA, not posters, to solve a cold case murder. It focuses on the 25th anniversary of the unsolved murders of Julie Williams and Lolly Winans in the Shenandoah National Park. You've heard us talk about this case briefly on Mind Over Murder at different times. We may do more in-depth coverage when the time is right. Deirdre Enright and the people at the Innocence Project had actually defended a man that was charged in that case. The focus of the piece, though, is the electronic billboards that we had mentioned here on Mind Over Murder. And Deirdre and other people that lived in Washington, D.C., and some of our listeners had all noticed that the FBI was using the electronic billboards to request information from the public in the Julie Williams, Lolly Winans murder. Deirdre's key point is that the FBI should be testing the available evidence Mm -hmm. using the latest DNA technology to see if they can solve the murder of Julie Williams and Lolly Winans through advanced forensics, which is exactly the same thing we're asking for in the Colonial Parkway murders. And anyone who's familiar with us knows that our first response to that was, hell yeah, they should be doing that. Absolutely, (laughs) they should be doing that. Looking at some of the comments y'all have posted on our social media page, we know most of you feel the exact same way. It is very gratifying, as I said earlier, to hear from all of y'all that you're on the same page that we are and that you want the same things from this case as we do. We noted this morning that after only about 17 comments, most everybody agreeing with Deirdre Enright that the FBI should be using DNA and not electronic billboards to solve a cold case murder that's now 25 years old as we close in on our 35th anniversary of the start of the Colonial Parkway murders this fall. 
The Washington Post has turned off the comments section, which I find <laughs> disappointing. So only 17 readers, myself included, and others made comments. And then for some reason, they turn off the comments section. I'm a bit disappointed in the Washington Post. We will include a link in the show notes to this episode of Mind Over Murder. So it's easy for you to take a look at the piece. It's thoughtful and well-written, and I think worthy of the FBI's consideration. It's a shame that the internal politics at the FBI, and I'm not talking about Republicans versus Democrats here, folks. I'm talking about internal politics at the FBI and the DOJ. Who's in, who's out, who's in charge, what cases get precedence, that kind of thing. That seems to be having an impact on whether or not cases receive resources. And much like the Colonial Parkway murders, the murder of Julie Williams and Lolly Winans does not seem to be a priority for the FBI, which is a shame. So if you're interested in taking a look at that op-ed, we will have a link to that in the show notes. We are moving on to our topic of discussion for today, and that is the double murder of Robin Edwards and David Knobling on Ragged Island. At this point, we have finished talking about both of the FBI cases, and so we are going to move on to the Virginia State Police cases. There are two jurisdictions involved in the Virginia State Police cases, which we will talk about. But in terms of timeline, Bill, where does this case fall in the timeline of the Colonial Parkway murders? Because we did talk about the cases out of order. Yeah, this is case number two. You remember that Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski were killed in October 1986. Almost a year later, on September 20th, David Knobling, who was age 20, and Robin Edwards, age 14, were found shot to death in a place called the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge. It's next to the James River, which is a substantial body of water. Kristen can tell you more. Mm -hmm. In Isle of Wight County. So this is opposite Newport News, Hampton Roads, and the the major population centers, and a massive facility where they build and refurbish U.S. Navy ships. Mm -hmm. On this side, on the far side, I think of it, next to the James River Bridge, which puts you near Smithfield, Virginia, home of Smithfield Hams. I've been by their facility where unhappy pigs live. (laughs) And it, it's, it is a totally charming, adorable little town. They've got a beautiful little section of streets with uh, restored Victorian houses and great places to eat and shop. So we love going to Smithfield, but we do pass Ragged Island to get there. It was even smaller back then. Remember, we're yes, talking about 30 plus years ago. It was kind of the country. Smithfield, I agree, is completely charming, great coffee and, and yeah. cool little antique shops. And it's a really, really neat little place. You drive right by the Ragged Island Wildlife Refuge as you enter Isle of Wight County. And it is one of those places where if you don't know it's there, you will miss it. When I first went to the scene, and this was independent of Bill, you and I had not been there at that point together. We'd been to some of the others, but not that one. It actually took me a little bit of of doing to figure out where's the turn and how do I need to maneuver my car to get there. So it is one of those places that if you blink, you'll miss it. And if you don't know where it is, you may have a bit of a time trying to get there. If anybody is trying to get there, as you head out of Newport News, you're going to cross the four and a half mile long James River Bridge. It's a long bridge. The JRB. As soon as you hit land, you're going to be slowing down quickly and taking the absolute first left you can. Yes. And don't blink and you will miss it. There's no traffic yeah. light or anything like that. And then that kind of loops around mm-hmm. and you end up right next to the James River Bridge. And interestingly, one of the investigators who took me there for the first time some years ago now did point out that the physical structure of the James River Bridge actually blocked passing motorists from being able to see down into the sandy parking lot where David Knobling's Ford Ranger truck was found three days after they had gone missing in September 1987. For those of you who are going to ask, is this adjacent to the Colonial Parkway? The answer is no, it is not adjacent to the Colonial Parkway. I know that for those of y'all that are not here or local, the geography of the region can be a little confounding at times. So just in the in the interest of helping those of you that are not local, no, Ragged Island is nowhere near the Colonial Parkway. And in fact, you have to go quite a good distance out of your way to get to the JRB 
and Ragged Island. What do you think? 30, 40 minute drive maybe? Yeah, from yeah, the- at the very, very least. If you use the Colonial Parkway where the Thomas Dowski and Call Haley incidents took place as a center point, and that's valid because Mm -hmm. it is sort of in between, I would say it would be 30, 40 minutes, maybe 30 minutes at night, 40, maybe even 45 minutes to get there if you started from one of the Colonial Parkway murders sites. This is incident number two. It's worth noting that Edward Snobling murder was not linked to the Colonial Parkway murders in any way that most of us can recall. Kathy and Becky had been killed a year before, but given the fact that this is incident number two, it happened in a somewhat similar location, but Robin and David were found shot to death. No one seemed to feel that this had anything to do with a lesbian couple being killed using rope and knives right. on the Colonial Parkway, say 40, 45 minutes away. So no one seemed to link the two incidents. Isle of Wight County Sheriff's Department, which has grown tremendously as Isle of Wight has grown, into much more of a, maybe suburban's not exactly what I mean, but there's a lot of housing developments and yeah, mm-hmm. very nice condos on the water and that kind of thing. Back then, it was kind of the boonies, and I don't mean that in a disrespectful way. Yeah. And Isle of Wight Sheriff's Department was so small, as I understand it, they actually didn't feel like they had the resources mm-hmm. to handle a double homicide investigation of this type. They then took a back seat and allowed the Virginia State Police to assume the lead role in the investigation of David Nobling and Robin Edwards. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back. Who wants some brand new Mind Over Murder merchandise? You do, of course. And our friends at Tee Public have hooked us up with some great merchandise. There are Mind Over Murder t-shirts available in about six different weights, female, male, soft, not so soft, something that looks like your old gym shirt. (laughs) (laughs) And in any color that you want as well, the possibilities are limitless. And then we have tank tops, crew neck sweatshirts, which probably won't be big in July, but might be more popular, say, in October. Better for those cooler months. (laughs) And also for cooler months, long sleeve t-shirts baseball t-shirts and you get to configure the color of the shirt and the color of your sleeves you could do your entire women's softball team in mind over murder baseball i like that idea we've also got mugs available magnets stickers laptop cases phone cases and tote bags i'm going to order a couple of tote bags i can take one every day of the week to school We've got masks, which I hope we won't be wearing soon. (laughs) Right? (laughs) And wall art, notebooks, a pillow. Don't know if I need a mind over murder pillow, but somebody else might love it. Absolutely. Perfect for your living room. (laughs) And then for the younger crime fighters, we have kids t-shirts, kids hoodies, kids long sleeve t-shirts in a variety of colors. All of these things can be configured just about in any color you can imagine. And then my favorite, the Mind Over Murder onesie for the smallest crime fighters among us. So if you're interested in any of this great merchandise, take a look at the website at tpublic.com and type in Mind Over Murder podcast, and that will get you to all of our merch. You can also look for links on our social media pages and in our show notes. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. Now, when we talk about Virginia State Police involvement, there are actually two different offices of the Virginia State Police that handled the two VSP cases. As we've said before on Mind Over Murder, this complicates things because you have two separate Virginia State Police officers handling two of the murders that are considered part of the so-called Colonial Parkway murders. They don't actually happen on the Colonial Parkway. For the purposes of the Robin Edwards David Noblin case, the Chesapeake office of the Virginia State Police became the lead agency. Can you hear a siren? Yeah. It's noon here in our small town. <laughs> oh, oh, okay. Are you getting a okay. Yeah, it's okay. I was like, that didn't sound like a police siren. No, it's the emergency call in the middle of town. It's twelve oh, noon in our small town. Sad. So the detectives from the Chesapeake office of the Virginia State Police became the lead agents and the Isle of Wight Sheriff's Department was more in a support role. 
at this point, are the Virginia State Police still investigating this case? I don't have the direct contact that I do with the FBI, and we'll be asking family members of Robin Edwards and David Nobling to join us in the coming weeks. So I'll let them speak to that. I don't think the investigation of the Robin Edwards, David Nobling case is as active as it should be. And I will take it a step further. I've had some great conversations with members of the Edwards and Nobling family who feel that there may be opportunities for advanced forensic testing of the available DNA evidence, which could be very helpful in moving this case forward. And I think we'll want to get into that further with Robin's sister in an upcoming episode of Mind Over Murder. So first of all, it's important to acknowledge that Robin Edwards is our youngest victim. Uh, Whereas Kathy was 27 and Becky was 21, Robin is by far the youngest of the victims in the Colonial Parkway murders case. She was 14 years old. Her family and friends uh, have always described her as spirited, I think is probably a good way to describe her. We've heard people describe her as sort of an old soul, somebody who I, I don't, I'd describe her if she was one of my students, I would describe her as sassy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she was definitely a 14 year old who was maybe a little, acted maybe a little older than her years suggest. Yeah, 14 going on 24 is probably a fair description. And we're not implying any criticism here. Robin's not a little kid. She's got a rebellious streak. She's headstrong. She's run away from home several times. And she's not your typical 14-year-old girl. Precisely. So she was found on Ragged Island with David Knobling, who was 20 at the time of his murder. When we talk about the Colonial Parkway murders, we talk about couples. But David and Robin were not a couple. As we said, David was 20, Robin was 14, and they did not have, to our knowledge, a relationship outside of the fact that David had been acting as chaperone on that particular night for Robin's date with his cousin, I believe it was. You know, Robin and David did not have a relationship. In fact, I think you could probably say that the only real couple in the Colonial Parkway murder series is Kathy and Becky. We want to acknowledge that David was in a serious relationship with his girlfriend who was expecting a child and they were planning on getting married. And so this gets a little bit delicate. Again, we're not trying to attach a value judgment to reporting these facts. David's daughter actually appears in the Lover's Lane Murders television series, which we recommend if you haven't seen it Mm -hmm. on the Oxygen Network. She's now in her early 30s. At the time of his death, David was planning to marry his girlfriend, and obviously his tragic death cut those plans short. So there's this slightly awkward aspect of things, which is it appears that David was out with Robin Edwards that evening after they had dropped off his brother and cousin after a group of young people with David in the chaperone role, we put quotes around that, had gone out and spent an evening at an arcade and doing fun stuff. And then it appears that David dropped everyone off and then made plans to connect with Robin after he had dropped the others off, his brother and cousin. Now, we don't know what those plans entailed At this point, that is only one of many things that we can speculate on, but the two of them did end up at Ragged Island. We talked about Ragged Island a little bit already, but it is important to note one other thing, which is that it is very dark and very quiet, solitary, and it is a known spot for low-level drug transactions. So you can infer what you will from the fact that we have two people late at night in a place that is known for low-level drug transactions. For our younger listeners, we always have to remind you, remember, this is before cell phones and before the internet. So for pagers, you don't have the external forms of communication in 1987 that you have now. The spot they chose at Ragged Island is a place that's known for, as Kristen, you said, low level drug deals and also sexual trysts, both gay and straight. When... Blaine Pardo was working on his book on the Colonial Parkway murders. He was talking to a cop as he was heading there, and the cop made reference, an off-color reference, to 
what Blaine might be looking for at that location. And this is during the day, I might add. <laughs> Blaine was a little taken aback that the guy made this crack. That's what the area is known for, sexual trysts and low-level drug deals. If, and this is a possibility, if, for example, they had gone there to engage in sexual activity, that's a strong possibility. There's also a strong possibility this would be the kind of place that you would go to if you were looking to score some pot, let's say. So at some point or another during that evening, Robin and David encountered the person who would eventually murder them. Robin and David were both found on the beach at Ragged Island. Both had been shot in the head, although David did have an additional shot to his shoulder, which we have assumed, and I think law enforcement has also assumed, was the result of him perhaps trying to get away from his assailant. There was a three-day gap in between uh, the time when David's truck was found and when their bodies were discovered. If you remember our interview from Andy Fox of Wavy 10, he did talk about the rather harrowing circumstances under which both the Nobling and the Edwards family learned about the death of their loved ones. And that was through a TV report from Wavy News 10 and a shot of their bodies on the beach from Chopper 10. So if you haven't listened to that episode, we do recommend that you go back and listen to that one from Andy. It's always struck me that it's just about the worst way to find out that oh, your yeah. loved one has been murdered is you're watching television news and they announce that as part of the search for, at this point, a missing couple, they have found bodies on the beach about a mile away from the place where David's truck was found. Absolutely awful. You're listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll be right back after this word from our sponsors. One of the most frequent questions we're asked here at Mind Over Murder is, how can I help? Thanks to Othram, a leading forensic DNA testing lab for law enforcement, you can get involved and help solve real cases. If you have tested at a consumer genetics company, you can contribute your data to dnasolves.com. The process is easy and confidential. Just two simple steps. Your DNA might be the missing piece that helps solve the identity of an unknown person. Then Mind Over Murder will highlight cases Othram is working on to seek your crowdfunding support for DNA testing to help solve these cold cases. Upload your DNA profile to dnasolves.com. It's easy, free, and confidential. Then join Mind Over Murder as we help families find answers with Othram and dnasolves.com. We're back here at Mind Over Murder. David's truck was found in a way that struck people who knew him as being quite odd. For one thing, David normally backed his truck into a parking space. But at this point when the truck was found, it was not backed into a parking space. And apparently this was something that he was very, very conscientious of doing every time that he parked the truck, he back it in. I, I've never understood doing that. <laughs> like, I think it's a truck thing. I really is it a do. Truck guy thing? I see this with pickup truck drivers. I, I think it's like a, I always park my truck nose out so that I can pull away cleanly with okay. no backing out into traffic, even in a sandy parking lot next to a bridge. Because David's brother, Michael, even mentioned that he would do it at McDonald's and, you know, places they would go and hang out as kids. So it seems like it's a truck thing. And it's... Okay. And even if it's not a truck guy thing, it was certainly a David thing. And so really the first sort of suspicious thing about the way that David's truck was found is the fact that it was not backed down. Now, in addition, the keys were in the ignition. The wipers were on, kind of going back and forth and back and forth. <laughs> we're, both, we're both doing the exact same hand movement. <laughs> that was this. kind of strange. <laughs> was back and forth. The radio was turned to accessory, or rather the key was turned to accessories. And I assume that's because you want to maybe listen to the radio while you're sitting there hanging out. And the radio was on in this example. 
People have remarked on the fact that Kathy and Becky's car and David and Robin's car were both found in a state that neither driver would have left it in. David certainly would not have pulled his truck in nose first, um, and he would not have gone anywhere without the keys to his car. The phrase staged for theft started coming up, I would say probably right after Keith and Sandy's case, when Keith's car also turned up in a way that he would not normally have left it. Do you recall when that concept of the cars being staged actually started coming up? I'm not sure If it comes up immediately, but uh, I know the investigators had noted that once we moved past the first incident with Kathy and Becky and her Honda being pushed over the embankment, clearly not accessible, all the other vehicles are left with keys either in the ignition or right there on the center console, but very easily found. Investigators have theorized to me and others that they think that there's a possibility that the perpetrators are leaving the keys in or near the ignition with the hope that someone will come along, kids, I think is what they're Mm -hmm. thinking, and steal the vehicle or move the vehicle, which would create further time, space, and distance and create more confusion as to where law enforcement should be looking for bodies or other evidence related to that incident. Now, to the best of your knowledge, was David's wallet still in the car? I believe so. We're going to want to probably check some of these details with family members. Let's say yes for the moment. And I do remember very distinctly a crime scene photo of Robin's shoes in the car. Right. There's her shoes, which were tennis shoes, and she had put marker or doodled on them. And I know her mother mentioned that as soon as she saw them, she knew that they were Robin's. And there were articles of clothing in the car. It was rainy that evening, so they most likely were in the cab, and there were articles of clothing and shoes, as you've mentioned, found there, which is, again, similar to other Colonial Parkway murders crime scenes. Very, very similar. It did take three days for Robin and David's bodies to be found. And as we mentioned, first inkling that the families got that they had been discovered was from the Chopper 10 shot and the reporting from Wavy 10. There's been a lot of conversation on Mind Over Murder and in Blaine Pardo's book and on the television series Lover's Lane Murders about whether... Robin and David were marched directly to the water, which I would estimate is probably no more than about 200 yards in a Mm -hmm. straight shot, paralleling the James River Bridge, but not terribly visible from the bridge, or that Robin and David were marched, it could be three quarters of a mile or more, Mm -hmm. down a gravel path through the marsh. Now, remember, this is in the dark, to an area closer to the beach where they were found, which is about a mile downriver from where the truck was found. I personally think that the simplest explanation is the one that makes the most sense and probably fit the principle they call Occam's razor, which means that Robin and David were either in the truck, perhaps closer to the beach, There's a fence there now, but you actually could drive to the edge of the water there next to the bridge. And a lot of people use that as kind of a boat launch Mm -hmm. to take small craft in and out of the water. David's truck, I don't believe it's a Ford Ranger, but I don't believe it was four wheel drive. But he might have been able to get fairly close to the water if he chose to. Or alternatively, and again, I'm trying to keep things simple. I think it's perhaps most likely that they were interrupted while in the parking area and then forced to walk to the edge of the water, probably at gunpoint, and then executed somewhere close to the end of that road, which is that sandy beach area that we discussed next to the bridge. And then their bodies were dumped in the water after they were shot, and then they floated downstream to be discovered three days later. That, I think, is the explanation that makes the most sense. I don't buy the idea that they were marched three quarters of a mile or more through a dark, sometimes swampy area. Yeah. This beautiful marsh. Yeah, I've walked it. It's And this is during the day. Yeah. And and I have as well. I've been to that site at night, but not walked all the way down the path to the area closer to where their bodies were found. I just don't think it makes sense to march somebody 
barefoot down yeah, a gravel I'm saying, path they're barefoot. Yeah. across yeah. across several small bridges you know that that uh, are foot bridges mm-hmm. the whole thing just doesn't make any sense to me if you could take someone directly to the water yeah. kill them dump their bodies in the water and be done with it versus taking 20 or 30 minutes think about you wouldn't even be able to walk very fast if you were barefoot right. take a terrified half-dressed couple down this winding, muddy gravel path through the marsh. It, 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 the whole thing just doesn't make any sense to me. Especially if time is of the essence. We don't have time of death, or at least not that I'm aware of. But if you're in a place where you know it's known to be a place for low-level drug deals or sexual trysts, at some point or another, if you're the offender, you're going to have to worry about, is somebody else going to roll up on me while I'm doing this? If time is of the essence, you're not going to take time to walk somebody barefoot down a gravel road with a whole bunch of you know little footbridges when you can just take them directly across the beach and be done with it in five minutes, maybe. So yeah, I agree with you. It doesn't make a whole ton of sense. Isle of Wight sheriffs and then Virginia State Police officers had come to the scene because what they found effectively was an abandoned Ford Ranger pickup truck with, as you pointed out, the windshield wipers on and the the radio on. Clearly, they hadn't been gone long enough for the battery to go dead. And the truck wasn't running. It was in the accessory position, as you mentioned. So they were dealing initially with a missing persons case But something that was sitting in this parking area that was regularly patrolled by county and state police as they passed by. Regarding their gunshot wounds, the Virginia State Police, like the FBI, has sometimes not been willing to share all of the information on the case, which we understand. Autopsy reports describe the two of them as having been shot with a small caliber weapon. So it sounds like something like a 38 or perhaps even a 22 was used as the weapon to kill them. Then the bodies are dumped in the water. There is DNA evidence in this case. It is badly deteriorated. It's almost 34 years later. We are hoping that the Virginia State Police will consider using advanced forensics in this case Our understanding is the amount of evidence is very small. Remember, many DNA tests actually consume evidence as they're being performed, and there have been attempts to identify a perpetrator or perpetrators in this case. We're hoping that advanced forensics, like those available from Othram Labs, could be used in this case, and the families, the Edwards and Nobling families, are continuing to lobby for such tests to take place. And we'll be talking about that further. To our knowledge, we don't have any bullet fragments or anything like that. And we are not 100% certain, as we discussed, exactly where the shooting took place, whether it was close to the truck or at the edge of the water close to the bridge or a mile away after a walk through the swamp in the dark. There are a number of missteps along the way in the Edwards Nobling case. Among them are a story about fingerprint cards being dropped in the driveway mm-hmm. of one of the family's homes, and we'll ask them to tell the story. It's really pretty shocking how sloppy some aspects of the investigation became. We've also found it very troubling that David's truck was returned to the Nobling family, who didn't really want David's truck. And then the truck was then taken away again by the Virginia State Police. There are things, even by the standards of 34 years ago, that kind of make you cringe in terms of the way the investigation moved forward. And of course, we did start with a missing persons investigation when David's truck was found abandoned. And then three days later, it turned into an investigation of a double homicide. There are things about the handling of this investigation that just make me shake my head. And it's easy for us to do a little Monday morning quarterbacking whenever we talk about the case. And and we know that it's also easy for a number of our listeners who are very invested in all aspects of criminal investigation to weigh in and do the same thing. But you're right, Bill, like there are certain things that happen with this investigation that just make you go, oh, really? Like who thought that would be a good idea? 
so it while it is easy for us to kind of sit here and say, well, in retrospect, that was not a great idea. But like at the time, it should have occurred to someone. This is not a great idea. We need to be doing something a little bit different here. There have been a number of suspects who've been mentioned in connection with the murder of Robin Edwards and David Nobling. As you know, we don't mention suspects by name. We will make an exception in some examples if we know that someone is deceased. One person I will mention by name is Samuel Sammy Reeder, R-E-I-D-E-R, who actually spoke to law enforcement and put himself at the scene. He claimed in his story, and I'm not saying I buy this, Reader claimed that he was there and that he entered the truck while David and Robin were engaged in sexual activity in nearby bushes, which on a rainy night, it, yeah. it, the, whole, the, the whole thing doesn't really fit. If you've got a truck right there. Yeah. Do you want to be inside a warm, dry truck listening to music or do you want to be fooling around in the bushes? Mm, yeah, and I don't buy it. We're talking about this sort of beachy area with scraggly, low underbrush. These yeah. don't even look like comfortable bushes as Mm-mm. far as I'm concerned. I think what Reader was trying to do was to explain how he was inside the truck where perhaps fingerprints or other evidence would have shown him to be inside David's truck. Remember, this is a pre-DNA environment. DNA existed, but it wasn't being used in forensic analysis for law enforcement at this point. It's just making its way out of the lab. Supposedly, Reader went into the truck to rob them while they were distracted. That's his claim. And supposedly he found a small amount of money in David's wallet. And he claims he's the one that I believe tossed David's wallet up onto the dashboard. So he claims he was inside the truck while they were otherwise engaged. Reader was considered a pretty serious person of interest by law enforcement investigators from VSP and Isle of Wight. And I know he was questioned because we have the story that he told. Unfortunately, Reader died later in an auto asphyxiation accident or a suicide, a little hard to say. It would appear from the way the scene has been described to me that he died in a, an autoerotic asphyxiation accident. I could get more graphic, but do I need to? Yeah, don't, don't think so. Probably most of our listeners understand exactly what you're getting at yeah. for that. Some people may recall that Michael Hutchins from the rock band In Excess from Australia also died under similar circumstances. More music trivia from Bill Thomas. <laughs> Unfortunately, Sammy Reader's not around to answer questions. There have been other drug dealers mentioned as a possibility, including one man who supposedly had a thing for Robin Edwards and was very interested in engaging in sexual behavior with her. With or without her consent, we, we cannot mm. tell. It appears not. He's been mentioned as a suspect. He is sometimes referenced as Washington, but I'm here to tell you that's not his real last name. He is a Newport News area drug dealer, still alive and well as far as we know. That has always struck me as a possibility. It's a particularly confounding case. And then when you factor in all of the various missteps that have happened, it is hard to look at this case and feel optimistic about the fact that there will be a satisfactory conclusion to it. But as Bill said, there is forensic evidence that does need to be tested. We are hoping that at some point or another, Virginia State Police will decide that it is worth the risk of consuming the entire sample to get it tested. We know our friends at Othram have definitely said they are interested and willing to do those tests. We just have to see if the uh, good folks at VSP are willing to take that leap and allow that testing to happen. Now, because we've mentioned a few suspects, at least one by name, in Robin Edwards and David Nobling's murder, don't misunderstand that that means we're discounting another working theory from right. law enforcement, which right. is it is entirely possible that the same person that committed the murder of Kathy Thomas and Rebecca Dowski a year prior may be responsible for Robin Edwards and David Nobling's murder almost exactly a year later. That theory would then hold that the perpetrator 
might have gone out perhaps in an attempt to recreate the experience of the year before killing a lesbian couple, now going to another place that's known for sexual behavior, Mm. a lover's lane, if you will, and then perhaps choosing a, a couple at random whom he finds engaged in whatever triggering behavior works for him. They talk about meeting the offender's needs. Right. When we talk to our friends, Jim Clemente and Dr. Laura Petler and other folks about serial offenders, that is definitely a possibility here that this case number two is sort of a repeat of the incident from the year before on the Colonial Mm -hmm. Parkway. So the fact that we mentioned a few individuals that might be directly responsible for this murder, perhaps alone, versus a through line. It is entirely possible that Robin Edwards and David Knobling could be the second couple killed in the so-called Colonial Parkway murders. And that is one of the most frustrating things about this case, isn't it? You can easily imagine scenarios in which there is one serial killer stalking couples on the peninsula, but you can also imagine scenarios where there are four entirely different unrelated cases. And if you watched Lover's Lane Murders, you do see that we have two experts who come to two very different conclusions with regard to that. And there have definitely been times when Bill and I are sitting and talking about the case, like ad nauseum and going, I don't know, I'm kind of on the serial killer theory this week. Actually, no, I'm not. I'm on the, I don't think this case is related. And we'll toss out certain cases and say, well, maybe these three are, but the other isn't. It's confounding. And at times it can be very frustrating. And for me personally, and I'm only one person of hundreds who've thought about this case and talked about this case, I am sort of now taking a middle ground, which is I think some of the Colonial Parkway murders Mm -hmm. are related, but I don't think all of the Colonial Parkway murders are related in that one, two, three, four incident connection that we've talked about. There are these other unsolved homicides in the area, Lorianne Powell, Brian Pettinger, and others that could potentially tie in to some of the Colonial Parkway murders. So as Jim Clemente mentioned in the Lover's Lane murders, we could be looking at a copycat situation or even just unrelated, just kind of overlapping murder patterns. So it's not all as straightforward as we'd like it to be. I think that as a culture that is very interested with true crime and in crime-related TV shows, we know I'm a Criminal Minds fan and a CSI fan, the narrative of a serial killer stalking couples around the peninsula, that's an interesting narrative. It's a more interesting narrative, I think, for some people than this is four different people, four different killers. So I think that that may be why some people seem to like that theory. Certainly, it's it's one that I held on to for a long time before I started working with you when I realized, okay, actually, maybe, probably, these are not all related to each other. It's worth noting that the Robin Edwards, David Knobling murder is the only murder that we're aware of in the so-called Colonial Parkway murders where a firearm is used. It's entirely possible that a firearm may be used to establish control Mm -hmm. At the beginning of any of these incidents, in other words, I've had a gun pulled on me. I talked to my younger brother who was also robbed at gunpoint at one point. You do comply. You know, someone sticks a gun in your face and you're thinking you're going to do everything you can to get out of the situation alive. And all you want to do is comply with this person, give them what they want and get rid of them. That we're aware of. Because unfortunately, as we know, Keith and Cassandra have never been found. And so they do throw a bit of a wild card into the mix. We just don't know whether or not a gun was used on them. And I think if we reach a point where their bodies are found, I think it's entirely possible a lot more answers are going to fall into place. Or maybe we'll just have more questions. (laughs) There's always that possibility. (laughs) Yeah. And then even in incident number four, which we'll be talking about in the coming week with Anna Maria Phelps and Daniel Lauer, who were found on off I-64, because we have bones and bone fragments at that scene, it's possible that they may have been shot and we just have a through and through, as they call it, where yep, soft tissue. the bullet enters the soft tissue and exits and then isn't found because where the bodies were found is not necessarily where they were put to death. 
We believe a knife was used in that example, but nothing precludes a gun. So again, we have these confounding is the word of the day, I think, situations where we don't have all of our answers. We'll be continuing coverage of the Robin Edwards and David Noveline murders by talking to the victims' families in the coming weeks. Thank you so much for listening to Mind Over Murder. We'll see you next time. Mind Over Murder is a production of Absolute Zero and Another Dog Productions. Our executive producers are Bill Thomas and Kristen Dilley. Our logo art is by Pamela Arnois. Our theme music is by Kevin McLeod. Mind Over Murder is distributed in partnership with Crawl Space Media. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. You can also follow our page on the Colonial Parkway Murders on Facebook. And finally, you can follow Bill Thomas on Twitter at BillThomas56. Thank you for listening to Mind Over Murder.